I am pleased to introduce interventional cardiologist, Dr. Benjamin Peterson. Dr. Peterson specializes in structural and valvular heart diseases at St. Elizabeth Healthcare. He is also the medical director of the Heart and Vascular Research Institute. His publications have primarily been focused on pharmacotherapy after percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI, including analyses of the Reduce It, Redual PCI, Champion, and other studies. He has a mu music degree from the Brigham Young University in Utah, a medical degree from the University of Rochester, and a Master of Public Health from the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health. He completed his residency at Duke University Hospital and fellowships in cardiology, interventional cardiology, and structural heart at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. He and his wife have four young boys. He is an avid distance runner and guaranteed to be experiencing one of the topics on this talk someday. Welcome, Dr. Peterson. Thank you. It's great to be here. Appreciate everyone's time this morning. I hope that what we share can um, not only uh, enrich us all, but perhaps uh, save some lives one day. Um, appreciate the kind introduction. I'm Ben Peterson, and this is a subject that's been near and dear to my heart uh, for many years. Uh, starting during my residency, I've been researching sudden death. Um, and also, as uh, Karen mentioned, um, sports are an important part of all of our lives. Uh, Nelson Mandela said, sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was despair. And I would just say uh, our community here in Northern Kentucky, uh, Eastern Indiana is no exception. Sport is uh, very important to who we are as a people and, and what we do. And so thank you to all of you for your tireless efforts to build um, sports medicine uh, in our community. Um, my talk uh, has several uh, things that I'd like to discuss. So we'll start by talking about what happens to the heart during normal exercise. We're going to discuss sudden death in athletes. Um, we're going to talk about commotio cortis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, then we're going to get into athlete's heart, Marfan's, and aortopathy, coronary disease. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about um, participation screening, um, exercise recommendations for patients with specific heart disease, and um, hopefully some future directions that we can take this as a community and as a healthcare system. So uh, the heart's an incredible organ. Uh, it can pump the equivalent of uh, an Eiffel Tower's column of blood using less uh, energy than a light bulb. Uh, and uh, it's also extremely versatile in the amount of uh, energy that it can produce and the amount of pump that it can do. Uh, there's a range uh, of uh, force that can be provided by the heart. Um, starting down at the usual baseline, three to five liters per minute, all the way up to 15 to 20 liters per minute at peak exercise. So that is generally regulated by the adrenergic response or the um, adrenaline system of our body. That first of all, increases our chronotropy or heart rate uh, up to 140, 170 or more uh, during exercise uh, from the usual 50 or 60 beats per minute. Also increases contractility. Um, from the normal 60 to 70 uh, uh, milliliters per beat uh, all the way up to 100 or more uh, during peak exercise. So um, the power uh, is uh, calculated by the cardiac output and the mean arterial pressure uh, as a product of those two things. So at rest, we're sitting at about 350 watts and at peak exercise, uh, over 2200 watts. Uh, so it's a quite a range of the amount of activity that can be done. The, the whole body responds, of course, in a way that um, optimizes our circulation during normal exercise. It all starts with sympathetic activity uh, from the central nervous system. Um, that um, triggers several different things within the heart itself, increasing heart rate and contractility, as we've mentioned. But it also increases venous return, optimizing preload for uh, faster filling, um, it also um, increases uh, the stiffness of the arteries all the way from the aorta all the way down to capillaries and arterioles, um, with exception of the large muscle beds where we have vasoconstriction and vasodilation and opposing forces, uh, optimizing flow into our large muscle beds. 
So with regular exercise, uh, there are changes that happen to the heart over time that are important to uh, note that are usually physiologic, but with large amounts of exercise or patients who have been exercising a long time or what we call master's athletes, people who've been exercising all their lives and uh, continue to do so into their um, 60s and beyond. Um, there is a physiologic lower resting heart rate as the heart becomes more efficient and is able to fill uh, better during uh, not only exercise, but also during uh, rest and even sleep. Um, we can see uh, athletes and um, uh, active patients with uh, physiologic and normal heart rates even in the 40s, and that's okay, and, and even a, a good sign. Um, if, we're, if it were to be measured, uh, subjects and patients with regular exercise do have uh, significantly improved uh, oxygen delivery to tissues, or VO2, as we measure um, in the cath lab. Um, you will see LV hypertrophy, and we'll get into that. Um, patients with a significant amount of um, a physiologic exercise will begin to see what we call athlete's heart, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, also, anabolic use of steroids uh, can certainly cause uh, uh, hypertrophy, but we also have to watch out for um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which we will also discuss later. Regular exercise stimulates angiogenesis, especially in the large muscle groups, and uh, very uh, mature uh, vascular health. Uh, which is a very good, um, and probably a lower risk of atherosclerosis. And we're going to get into that controversy a little bit later in the talk. So um, we'll uh, transition here to talk about sudden death in athletes, um, something that's important to our community. Uh, we Many of us remember Matt, uh, who uh, passed away suddenly on the soccer field in 2020, a uh, healthy 16-year-old young man with no prior medical history, um, lost all of a sudden uh, to uh, sudden cardiac arrest. Um, these things do affect our community, and there's much that can be done. And I'm very happy today to have with me Mike Quinn. He is a cardiac arrest survivor from our community and av advocate um, for uh, cardiovascular um, emphasis and, and um, in particular uh, sudden death prevention, uh, presence of AEDs on the field. I'd like to uh, give him a few moments to discuss his experience, um, both as a cardiac arrest survivor and his current uh, advocacy. So I'll scoot over and have you uh, come into the screen, Mike. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. I appreciate uh, everyone's attention and, and having me on this morning. So uh, many of you, I'm an athletic trainer. I work at Novacare Rehabilitation. Um, I really work more in the industrial setting these days instead of the athletic population, like many of you all do. But um, my daughter, younger daughter, plays um, club uh, soccer for, as you can see on my shirt there, Fusion uh, FC in Northern Kentucky. And as a parent and as an athletic trainer, I, you know, volunteer with uh, with our team to kind of, you know, number one, be on the field for injuries and whatnot, you know, typical athletic training duties, but also take them, you know, like through a stretch and flex program or, or whatever prior to their practices and games and. Uh, on March 6th, they had a practice and we were out outside and I took them through the usual um, stretching and get them prepared for that day's uh, practice. And then I typically, I'm not a soccer coach, so I hand them off to the coaches and I, you know, if it's nice out, I'm a, I would call myself a fair weathered runner. I wouldn't say I'm an athlete by any stretch, but, um, you know, I'd go for a jog or whatever around the field, you know, while I'm kind of watching uh, watching the practice and whatnot. And, and on that day, I, you know, last thing I remember is, is stretching uh, by my car and getting my earbuds in and, and things to, you know, that you would typically do to go for a run. <clears throat> and then the next thing I know, three days later, I wake up in the cardiac ICU with, uh, with what they told me, I suffered a heart attack. Um, the, the 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 fun part of the story, I guess, is you know in 2020 when when Matt Mangine Jr. went down, um, um, you know his grandfather uh, Bob Mangine, who many of you probably know, and the is a physical therapist and athletic trainer that works with us over at uh, the University of Cincinnati, um, and has done you know a ton of research on knee rehab and whatnot. So many of you may know him, but anyway, I've worked for him and with him for probably close to 30 years. And and uh, when his grandson, Matthew Jr. went down, I went to the funeral and and while I'm in line, you know, 
for the funeral waiting to you know for the talk to the parents and whatnot you know i just you keep thinking to yourself number one it's heartbreaking and this just can't happen and you automatically think of your child and and, and what they do and you, know, you start thinking about as an athletic trainer i start thinking you know is my team or my daughter's team prepared for something like this you know do we have an aed are all of our coaches cpr trained you know what can we do to prevent this from happening again and being in this same situation um, so I went back to our board and talked to them about getting, uh, obtaining AEDs. Um, Fusion, you know, like many clubs, have many teams, um, and we pretty much just practice anywhere we can find green space. We're not at a particular facility necessarily or places that have AEDs. And I think at the time, Fusion probably had 25 or 30 competitive teams and another 25 or 30 recreational teams. And to have each coach to have an AED is a you know large undertaking financially for a small club uh, and an inexpensive club for the parents. So um, I had the Matt, Matt Mangine Jr. Foundation was was formed and I brought them in and and um, finally, you know, said, hey, you know, at least we, the least we can do is get all of our coaches trained in CPR. So we did the Take 10 program or the basically the hands only CPR training uh, for all of our coaches. I um, hosted that along with one of our other parents was um, Chris Vogapol, who is a works for St. Elizabeth and he teaches CPR. And so he volunteered to do it for free. So we had about 20 of our coaches or so about two weeks prior to me, to my incident on March 6th. Luckily for me, two of the coaches, two of our coaches were at that at that training and learned CPR. And they're the ones that came into action on my behalf when I went down. Um, you know, they knew they knew how to do the skill. Um Actually, a nine-year-old boy was on the field and saw it was the first to see me or witness me uh, to go down when I was jogging and told his dad. His dad called 911, alerted our coaches. Um, I had CPR performed on me within two under two minutes of me going down. And I the squad and the uh, AD was on me less than five minutes. So I'm extremely lucky to say the least. Um, there's a lot of things that could have gone the wrong way. Um, that I wouldn't be here today. Um, I could have chose to jog through the neighborhood uh, instead of around the field where I maybe probably wouldn't have been found until, you know, minutes or you know, many minutes later or whatever and had been too late. So um, so that that's my story. It's been well documented. I know St. Elizabeth is, is writing up something on me. I've been on the news a couple of times, but, you know, now I, I try to work uh, with the Matthew Mangine Foundation to go out and teach uh, Take 10 training. I think we've seen a lot um, on social media and the news of you know, a lot of the high schools and a lot of the athletic trainers that are on the on the call may be hosting this or having this at your schools, which is outstanding. Um, we have a better idea of, of emergency action plans or uh, EAPs, which are essential and I think now a law in Kentucky. Um, uh, recently, I don't know how well it's being enforced yet, but um, I think that's our standard of care in athletic training in Kentucky uh, and in Ohio, for that matter. Um, and when I go out and do and, and help with these trainings, you know, another thing I'm really advocating for is is to, you know, if you're in a crowd and someone goes down, I think a lot of times people assume that someone else is going to go into action and someone else is going to call 911. Um, and I think that's probably the worst part to have a cardiac event is in a group of people because of that fact. When it's one-on-one, -on -one, you know that you're the only one that's going to help this person. Um, so you're the one that is forced to call 911 and go into action. So really just um, imploring these folks that are, are learning these skills um, to not be afraid to uh, intervene. Um, you know, we're all in healthcare, so we're used to uh, springing into action. But if you're not in the healthcare system or a healthcare worker, you, know, you tend to be a little scared of it. And, you know, am I going to get sued if I do CPR and give breaths? Am I going to get, 
you know, COVID in, in these days or, or whatever, there's a lot of misconceptions out there um, of what you can get from someone else per se. Um, so I, I think that's an important um, component of teaching CPR and AED, how to use an AED and really teaching people how to be a first responder um, and go and get CPR trained and learn these skills, these life-saving skills, along with basic first aid and how to you know, stop a bleed or, or something like that um, are all important. So um, that's kind of what uh, I try to do now. I'm trying to do this more with our industrial clients that I work with. Uh, you know, you guys focus on the athletes. I'm trying to focus more on the uh, everyday factory worker, if you will. Many times they'll have a safety committee or whatever that's in charge of things like that but you know maybe the safety committee member that's on that shift is not uh, there that day or, or what have you so trying to get these industries to teach everyone how to do cpr hands only cpr and how to run an aed and how to call 911 i know it sounds silly but you know hey joe you go call 911 and sam or betty you go out and meet this the, the ambulance and tell them where to come and all that kind of stuff. That saves time, that saves minutes, which is vitally important in a cardiac event. Um, so I think that's my spiel, so. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. It's an honor to have you with us today. And um, I would I would add to that, I uh, just, or echo that I really hope everyone here uh, today is uh, CPR trained, has hands-only CPR training and, and is ready to be an advocate. Uh, sudden cardiac arrest does take 350,000 lives every year in the United States. It is the leading cause of uh, uh, cardiovascular death. And so uh, not only important for our athletes, but if you're in an airport or crowded space somewhere, or a family member, um, it's likely that um, we, uh, many of us may be involved one day in a situation like that. So thank you for that important um, uh, message. Um, let's talk for a moment about sudden death in athletes. Uh, it is a very uh, uh, important phenomenon to recognize. Uh, it is the leading cause of death among athletes. About one in 40,000 or one to 80,000 every year um, is the uh, prevalence of that. Uh, it causes 100 to 150 deaths uh, on average per year during competitive sports. Um, uh, Pre-participation screening uh, does yield um, a high-risk abnormality in about uh, one to two percent of patients, so it's it's not nothing. Um, the uh, prevalence of sudden death by sport is a little bit surprising. Um, it, this has been carefully studied. Um, the uh, sports with the highest risk of sudden death uh, are the ones that uh, tend to have the fastest heart rates: cycling, jogging, soccer being at the top, uh, followed by uh, hiking, swimming, basketball, rugby, tennis, and others. Um, and so uh, soccer being so prevalent in our community, I think it's a, another thing to keep in mind. Um, so uh, survival rates are not good for patients who suffer cardiac arrest. Uh, in Durham, North Carolina, where I performed a study, uh, we had about a five to 6% survival rate of an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest as, as a community, which is similar to the national average. Um, but among athletes, it is somewhat higher, but not high enough. We're at about a 15% discharge alive rate among athletes who suffer a sudden cardiac arrest. And again, speedy uh, initiation of CPR, defibrillation, notification of EMS are the things that uh, we as a community can do to respond faster to these situations. And in, those, and in that case, uh, can save, definitely save lives. And I would also point out, um, there's a significant chunk of these patients who never did receive resuscitation. Uh, in, in this uh, series of 820 patients. And so um, just a, a, as was said, making sure that each one of us considers ourselves, a, in a sense, a, a responder, a, a, as do all those who work with us. Um, I'm going to take a moment to show a video uh, produced by the University of Washington about sudden death among athletes. This is going to show real episodes uh, from prior sporting events. Um, I guess I would just put out a warning if anyone uh, might be triggered by these uh, 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 footages, just uh, keep that in mind. But this is important, I think, for us to recognize as we are uh, uh, participating in sporting events and to know what to look for.
Hi everyone, I'm John Dresner, director of the UW Medicine Center for Sports Cardiology, and in the next 100 seconds, I want to show you how to recognize sudden cardiac arrest in an athlete. He can be seen coming out of a timeout huddle, his head dropping. He stumbles, then alarmingly, he falls face first. Here you see Keontae head drop, stumble, sudden collapse. This is what sudden cardiac arrest in an athlete looks like. And collapses, just like Hamlin did, in sports from football to lacrosse to baseball. And Mark Vivian Foe, he shows all the signs of sudden cardiac arrest, continued breathing after collapse, eyes open and rolled back, the face of sudden cardiac arrest. For DeMar, after his arrest, his arms go up with seizure-like activity. For Christian Erickson, a sudden collapse, also unresponsive, eyes open, brief seizure activity in his leg. This is sudden cardiac arrest. We've been there, but that's, that's not a good look at all. With Claire, a dramatic episode, collapse with seizure-like activity in the arms, an amazing emergency response. Call for help, someone go get the AED. in a collapsed athlete that is unresponsive to verbal stimuli and a shoulder tap, you must assume it's sudden cardiac arrest. Call for help, start chest compressions, get the AED. Anyone can save a life. Hi, everyone. Let me get out of that and go on to the next slide here. So um, there are a number of things that can underlie sudden cardiac arrest uh, pathologically that I think are important to recognize. And in, in some, there's a structural abnormality such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, ARVC, dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, congenital abnormalities of the coronary tree, aortopathy such as Marfan or valvular heart disease, and we'll get into these entities. There's also things that can occur um, within a structurally normal heart that are also congenital or genetic, such as long QT, uh, CPVT, catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. We have some notable cases of that in our community. Uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, WPW, uh, with accessory pathways, um, Brugada syndrome, and other channelopathies. Um, there can be uh, acquired conditions in our older patients, such as uh, Bread and butter, atherosclerotic coronary heart disease, uh, myocarditis uh, was a common entity and important to recognize, especially during COVID, uh, but continues to be something that can occur with viruses. Um, Kawasaki disease uh, can occur, of course. And then in structurally normal hearts, uh, without any uh, abnormalities, you can get drug-induced long QTs. You can have commotion cortis has happened to uh, Hamlin, or you can have uh, other substances or environmental factors, even uh, heat and uh, electrolyte disturbances uh, can can uh, lower the threshold for arrhythmias. So um, among uh, sudden cardiac death uh, patients, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is by far the most common of these, uh, 36% or so. Um, there are others who have variable LVH that may be athlete's heart or may be uh, brewing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy whose mutation has not yet been uh, defined. Uh, we do see uh, congenitally abnormal coronary arteries, uh, myocarditis, ARVC has been seen, uh, mitral valve prolapse is an important entity, and then you have these other uh, less common things, and in some, uh, there's a structurally uh, normal heart, but that is actually uh, uncommon to see uh, among athletes. So uh, a, a word about commotion cortis, it can happen, uh, definitely, um, as happened to Hamlin. Uh, this is where there's a blunt trauma to the chest. It doesn't need to be that forceful, but it is occurring during the reperfusion electrical phase of the heart. If it happens just right at the onset of the T wave, it can then trigger ventricular uh, ventricular fibrillation. Um, and that uh, is a mechanical uh, failure that just trips up the electrical system of the heart and, and causes a fatal arrhythmia as was seen uh, so dramatically a few months ago. Um, 
So um, it has been reported in the literature uh, to occur uh, most commonly during uh, baseball, but has also been seen in softball and famously American football. Um, it's usually uh, uh, projectiles, uh, mostly in males. Um, there are high rates of CPR and defibrillation when it occurs um, in sports, but there's still a 66% mortality associated with one of these events. Um, and in non-sporting uh, 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 arenas, it can be seen as well in uh, assaults, motor vehicle accidents, or even uh, play among children. Um, and again, uh, those uh, other episodes are less recognized and do have a higher mortality. Uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as I mentioned, is the leading cause of uh, sudden death among athletes. And it's the thing that we do uh, really uh, encourage uh, for screening in particular. It started uh, with mutations within the myosin and troponin genes primarily, but there are others as well. Um, this leads to myocyte hypertrophy, uh, disarray and uh, fibrosis, excuse me, uh, you can get uh, diastolic dysfunction as usually the first uh, physiologic finding, and then you start to get LV outflow tract obstruction and, and also arrhythmias uh, as, as uh, leads to sudden death. Um, about 0.2% uh, of screened athletes will be found to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it does account for nearly 40% of sudden death on, in athletes. Um, the annual risk of sudden death for a person who's known to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy ranges from well under 1% to upwards of 6% and risk stratification and, and uh, careful um, uh, medical follow-up with a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy specialist is important to understand that difference. Um, so in athletes who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, compared with uh, non-athletes who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we do see milder left ventricular hypertrophy with um, wall thicknesses uh, generally under two centimeters. Uh, you do see an increased LV cavity size also, and this is probably just because of those efficiencies of the heart that we have discussed. Um, sometimes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is really only in the apex and causes uh, little to no left ventricular outflow tract obstruction or murmur, but can still cause a sudden death and arrhythmias. Um, only 14% have uh, a concentric or uh, even hypertrophy is, is more commonly seen with the athlete's heart um, that is more physiologic. Uh, you do see improved diastolic function compared with those who uh, do not exercise. You see less systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve leaflet, uh, which is an evidence of that LVOT obstruction. You see, but you do see similar degrees of fibrosis on cardiac MRI. and uh, and. One of the things that's notable is the surface ECG is more likely to pick up an abnormality. Um, and that is a simple thing that can be done uh, that can uh, definitely save a life. Surface ECGs are, are tricky in young people who are skinny. You're going to see large voltages. You're going to see reperfusion abnormalities. Um, but uh, always worth uh, consulting a uh, cardiologist if you think something looks off on one of these because uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy often does present with large voltages um reperfusion abnormalities that are um pretty specific um so uh among patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um there's a range of severity and level of risk with participation in sports and this is important to note uh, patients um who have no or little gradient who um have normal response to exercise without arrhythmias on their Holter monitoring um, can participate in high intensity exercise uh, with close medical follow up uh, without too much risk. As I was saying, their risk of a sudden death could be well under 1% in this category. But as the uh, LVOT gradient increases, as you have uh, blood pressure drops or attenuated uh, blood pressure increase with exercise, as you are seeing more arrhythmias on Holter monitoring, um, then uh, Moderate intensity exercises and low uh, intensity exercises may be the, the ceiling of what these patients uh, can uh, do. And so very important to, again, have them seen by a sports cardiology specialist to really sort that out when it's known. Um, and again, um, sorting out the difference between hypertrophic 
cardiomyopathy in athlete's heart can be tricky, uh, but also important uh, is just recognizing athlete's heart and the physiologic changes that can occur that can uh, lead to pathology uh, later uh, in patients who do not necessarily have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So uh, you do see uh, as, as athlete's heart progresses, you do see morphologic changes of LV hypertrophy. You begin to see dilation of the right ventricle and you do see biatrial enlargement. And that's um, uh, seen across the board uh, in patients who are uh, very avid athletes. You can see begin to see uh, physiological adaptations. First would be, a, again, um, increased diastolic filling and then diastolic impairment after that. You can see greater contractile strength and increased stroke volume and cardiac output. Uh, but again, over time, you can see increased risk, in particular, of atrial fibrillation. And this is important to note in our older cyclists and runners and, and people who are very active uh, over long periods of time, even decades, they are at increased risk of stroke and atrial fibrillation. Um, and it's important uh, to uh, stay on top of that in our master's athletes. Um, and again, we would recommend that they be seen by our sports cardiology program. They do have a higher incidence of stroke um, uh, than the general population, even though they are... Um, considered to be pretty healthy uh, individuals, and it is likely to be advantageous to anticoagulate them, even if their CHADS scores are not particularly high. Uh, one important controversy um, that has been seen on and off in the medical literature is that there is, in fact, increased coronary artery calcification in patients who undergo vigorous exercise compared with their more sedentary uh, counterparts. Um, and that's been shown on various CT scan studies, uh, as well as uh, coronary calcium uh, calculations. Um, however, there is, an, there is still an all-cause mortality benefit over moderate levels of exercise, uh, and, and no overall harm has been seen at higher or even extreme levels of exercise with respect to mortality. Um, you can also see uh, RV dysfunction on cardiac MRI over time in very... Uh, uh, very avid athletes. Um, and then uh, things like marathons or, or uh, Ironmans and things, you will start to see uh, myocardial uh, damage as evidenced um, by the troponins. So um, again, uh, in athlete's heart, you see eccentric biventricular hypertrophy with wall thicknesses generally under 1.5 centimeters. Um, you're going to see some dilation of the left ventricle with normal systolic function on an echocardiogram. In comparison, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you're going to see um, more of an asymmetric um, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. You're going to begin to see reduced LV diameter uh, and uh, definite uh, um, hyperdynamic contractility with near um, uh, obliteration of the LV cavity during systole in many cases. So the cavity sizes get down under 45 you're going to see uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction in about 70% of cases. And then the diastology is often abnormal on echocardiogram. Um, so um, in competitive athletes who undergo rigorous training, again, you'll start to see um, some hypertrophy is generally under 1.6 uh, on echo, but still worth keeping a close eye on. And in athletes with wall thickness of 13 to 16 in this gray zone, other ancillary findings, such as I mentioned, are important to watch. And in ambiguous cases, cardiac MRI is, is very clear in uh, determining between hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and athlete's heart. Changing gears a little bit into aortopathies, this is another important cause of probably the second leading cause of sudden death in, uh, in athletes. And, and it has uh, ended career uh, of athletes uh, as has been, been known. Many athletes are taller and more flexible and may, may actually have aortopathies. And it's important to screen for these um, and to think about, do they have a personal or family history of Marfan's or a other aortopathy? Are they tall? Do they have long limbs? Uh, do they uh, demonstrate hypermobility beyond uh, normal flexibility that you might see in an athlete? Um, it's very important to screen for heart murmurs, look for lens abnormalities, uh, stretch marks on the skin, scoliosis, and pectus uh, can also be clues of some of these aortopathies. Um, patients who have a bicuspid aortic valve can also have aortopathies. That's more like 1% to 2% of the general population is born with a bicuspid aortic valve. This generally does not affect people in the first three decades of life, um, but um, and, and moderate activity has uh, been shown to not uh, increase risk during vigorous sports, um, 
but may lead to uh, accelerated valve failure. And uh, still, so still important to note if you hear a, a heart murmur um, and a bicuspid aortic valve is picked up on echocardiography. So valvular heart disease um, is, uh, is my area of expertise, what I focus on within the heart center. Um, mitral valve prolapse and, uh, and again, bicuspid aortic valve are our most common um, uh, valvular pathologies that are seen in young people. Um, mitral valve prolapse is generally not severe in young people and generally asymptomatic, but is associated with an increased risk of arrhythmias and later in life, increased risk of degenerative mitral regurgitation and need for um, valvular surgeries. Um, and we already discussed uh, bicuspid aortic valve. But when you do see uh, a structural abnormality um, within the heart, you have to think of these valves are used 100,000 times a day. And it's like any other part, it can wear out over time and, and you can have uh, failure of the valve later on in life. And so uh, again, as we discussed at the beginning, you have these markedly increased hemodynamic loads and adrenergic surges during exercise. Um, and uh, that can, in a patient who has the valve disease, start to lead to aortopathy uh, at an accelerated rate. You can start to get pulmonary arterial hypertension. You can start to get arrhythmias. You can get functional deterioration further of the valve itself. You can start to have accelerated cardiac remodeling and myocardial ischemia. So um, patients with valvular disease do need to be closely followed um, as they participate in exercise, but uh, often can. So. Um, when a patient uh, has valvular disease, you want to watch for symptomatic um, uh, clues, uh, and that is a sign that they should slow down, as, as with anything else. Um, they do have an increased risk of infective endocarditis, uh, need to have good dental hygiene, and may need valvular prophylaxis with antibiotics, with things like dental work. Uh, they should avoid all tattoos and body piercings if they're known to have valvular heart disease, um, if at all possible. And they should get evaluated uh, uh, every one to two years with an echocardiogram and CS in the uh, sports uh, cardiology section. And then uh, they should, uh, in many cases, have first-degree relative screen, depending on the pathology involved. And as you know, St. Elizabeth Healthcare has a fantastic precision medicine group, um, and that's one of many situations in which we are rapidly pushing the envelope and looking for ways to better detect these things in our patients. So um, a word about our older athletes our master's athletes, um, with common things being common. Um, uh, atherosclerotic coronary disease is the primary concern and something that needs to be watched for, and they are often not uh, found to have overt clinical symptoms and may benefit from, um, from various forms of screening, including calcium scoring, uh, use of statin medications, and other things. Death from coronary disease is more common among less athletic counterparts, and I can't stress that enough. It is worth it to stay active, but there may be uh, other things uh, that are um, helpful. And, and for primary care doctors in the room, I would uh, stress that the European guidelines and soon the American guidelines are headed towards an LDL goal of under 55 and anyone at risk. And so uh, as we'll likely see an increase in our use of uh, non-statin medications or adjunct LDL lowering medications such as PCSK9 inhibitors and others. Um, atrial fibrillation, we already discussed, being much more common in these groups. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit um, to talk about the team and community-based approach to the cardiovascular care of athletes. The athletes themselves, friends and coaches, um, increasing awareness, having a culture of uh, medical screening, um, of uh, emergency plans, uh, CPR and AEDs, as was discussed. A sports medicine group, as you have here, um, with fantastic uh, clinicians and providers, um, and keeping uh, awareness of cardiovascular uh, uh, health on top of mind, and uh, and sports cardiologist. Um, uh, that's a, a growing a field within cardiology, and we're very happy to um, announce uh, here at St. Elizabeth we have a sports cardiology beginning. Um, I don't have uh, his picture in my slides. We have uh, Travis Huffman here. Starting this coming month, he's trained in sports cardiology and uh, will be starting a sports cardiology clinic. We're very excited to have him join us. And um, he's the person who should be giving this talk, but this talk is given one month too early. So I'm happy to give a shout out to him and I hope you will all get to know him. He's he's local, he's wonderful. Um, married to Taylor Huffman who works with us up on the fifth floor and uh, just a wonderful individual. And I hope that uh, many of uh, our patients can be 
uh, cared for him, uh, by him. So uh, again, another word for primary care physicians uh, here as we think about how to screen. The American Heart Association has put out a 12-point screening for uh, all young people who are thinking about participating in sports. This is important to go through, and we're always happy to provide this um, to various offices or any other clinicians who may be interested. Uh, we It's a simple history, family history, and physical examination. And these things can pick up on many uh, important findings. Um, it's also important to think about what the level of uh, activity will be, uh, and both between static components and dynamic components. And this, is, again, is where Travis can be very helpful, but people who are doing um, Ironmans and triathlons and various things uh, are going to need different kind of coaching than those participating in equestrian and arching. So uh, our, uh, so to keep those things in mind, um, having uh, uh, increased community awareness, as Mike has discussed, is very important. Um, and then lastly, I would just get into um, various different um, cardiac conditions do have different levels of activity uh, that are recommended, and it's nuanced. And this, again, is where sports cardiology can be very helpful. Uh, patients with bread and butter heart failure, just like cancer patients and others, are um, able to uh, have activity, and, and not only are they able to actually have lower mortality and do better with activity, but uh, to, there certainly can be too much of a good thing. Same with uh, uh, any other uh, of these conditions, um, but uh, we would recommend that uh, any folks with active cardiovascular disease certainly uh, follow with Travis as they uh, think about their levels of activity. Um, so uh, again, we're very excited to uh, launch our sports cardiology program here at St. Elizabeth Healthcare, and I stole this from our marketing team, and I hope that they don't mind that we have a sports cardiology right here. Um, so with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you for coming this morning, and we'll uh, see if there's any questions. Dr. Peterson, one question for you is, at what age should um, parents or athletic trainers really start watching athletes for signs of um, cardiac issues? Great question. Well, I would just add that that would be uh, at any point that the child is interested in getting involved with sports. Most schools and teams will recommend a physical, at least at the time of initiation with sports, and, and, and certainly not all of those can or should be seen by sports cardiology, but I think that's an important place for pediatricians, family practice docs uh, to, to do that. But, uh, but across the age, especially as we get older, uh, you know, and, and any, any adult who's thinking about getting involved newly with uh, uh, any kind of athletic activity should probably see their doctor and, and have a screening such as we showed from the American Car College of Cardiology. Let's see, we've got a question from uh, Matt Lloyd. Not hearing you, Matt. Feel free to speak up or type into the chat if we're okay. We'll watch for your question in the chat here. Another question. Does um, the heat or heat stroke have any impact on um, cardiology issues for athletes? That's another great question uh, to think about, especially as we're uh, undergoing a, a nationwide heat wave right now. Um, yes, uh, heat does increase the threshold, or sorry, excuse me, decrease the threshold for arrhythmias. And so uh, that just heightens our awareness of these things and and uh, raises the stakes a little bit. I, we would encourage um, uh, coaches and teams to be very thoughtful about uh, exercising in excessive heat. Uh, we would also want to make sure that uh, 
when we do exercise in summer months or, uh, or when we're involved with teams and sports to make sure that there's uh, good hydration and probably some electrolytes involved. In sports like baseball, um, some athletes wear um, heart guards. Um, do you recommend those for um, sports such as baseball and softball, or even for football after what we saw with Damar Hamlin? That's a great question. I, I, uh, I wouldn't uh, consider myself enough of an expert to speak out on that for sure. I think it definitely makes sense for uh, catchers and pitchers, uh, perhaps, to have those uh, those who may be uh, commonly involved in direct strikes like that, or to think about how to uh, keep football gear uh, safe and and have that uh, be involved. But I I will defer to those in in the industry to keep thinking about that. But I think I think in some cases it does make sense, especially for catchers. Okay, it looks like that concludes the question and answer period.